Support for today's podcast is brought to you by FS Investments. Finding income for your clients is tough. FS Investments makes it easier by designing solutions that help investors reach their income goals and secure their futures. FS Investments never settles, so advisors and investors won't have to either. Visit fsinvestments.com slash dead celebrities and discover what it means to never settle. This is not an offer to buy securities. Investors are advised to consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Welcome to the Dead Celebrities Podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenick. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Dead Celebrity Podcast. For anyone new to the podcast, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning catastrophes, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their core very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. Joining me today is Daniel Bernard. Dan is a tax attorney with the firm of Twomey, Latham, Shea, Kelly, Dubin, and Quartararo, LLP. That is a mouthful. Uh, He focuses his practice in the areas of estate planning, trust in in state administration, taxation, and estate litigation. Dan is admitted to the New York Bar, the New Jersey Bar, and the Florida Bar. And this affords Dan the opportunity to represent clients in all three states. Dan's combination of admission to the New York bar and Florida bar in particular is especially useful to clients who split their time between New York and Florida. Thanks for joining us, Dan. Thanks. Thanks, David. It's great to be here. The subject of today's episode is legendary American industrialist and philanthropist John D. Rockefeller. For everyone who wasn't paying attention that day in history class, Rockefeller founded the Standard Oil Company in 1870 and ran it until 1897 before ceding control, though he remained the company's largest shareholder. Uh, Rockefeller amassed an enormous fortune as kerosene and gasoline grew in importance, uh, eventually became the richest person in the world. Uh, Remember that at this time, electricity wasn't widespread, so oil and gas were used for just about everything. And that's before we factor in the boom that would occur when automobiles came into the picture several years later. Uh, Standard Oil became the first great business trust before its monopoly was broken up in 1911 by Supreme Court mandate. Interestingly, this only served to make Rockefeller even wealthier, as the constituent companies, which would eventually become names like ExxonMobil and Chevron, ended up being worth far more individually than they were as a whole. Uh, His peak net worth was estimated at, in today's dollars, $409 billion in 1913, and uh, his wealth alone represented about 2% of the national economy that year. Uh, Rockefeller spent the last 40 years of his life in retirement at his estate in Westchester County and his home in Ormond Beach, Florida. But he didn't sit idle. Uh, During this time, he basically created the structure of modern philanthropy by uh, founding a series of targeted foundations that would focus his charity on addressing specific issues. So I can already hear our listeners asking, what lesson can advisors possibly learn from basically the richest person ever that has any relevance to a typical client? Well, there are several, but for this episode, we're going to focus not on the business and philanthropy, but on that house in Florida. You see, Rockefeller was basically the first snowbird. Henry Morrison Flagler, one of the co-founders of Standard Oil, along with Rockefeller, bought the Ormond Hotel in 1890. It's one of the, and one of his very first guests at the hotel was his former business partner, John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller liked Ormond Beach so much that he bought an estate there called The Casements, and this estate still stands. It was purchased by the city in 1973 and now serves as a cultural center and historical monument. Now, in 1914, splitting time between Florida and New York was only possible because of Rockefeller's enormous wealth. Uh, the infrastructure simply didn't exist at the turn of the 20th century to make that sort of thing anything other than wildly expensive. But that infrastructure does exist today. 
and clients no longer need to be fabulously wealthy to maintain multiple seasonal residences. What once was the purvey of American aristocracy is nowadays pretty commonplace. So, Daniel, what are some of the planning considerations that advisors need to be aware of when working with Snowbird clients? Uh, absolutely, David. It's a great question. And uh, I agree this topic is becoming uh, more and more relevant as we just know more and more people. I think more and more advisors, as they uh, their client base gets a little bit older, they start to see more and more of these people uh, start to head south or, or west. And um, t- to me, the, the, the primary number one concern I would have in advising my Snowbird clients would be uh, these people are typically buying their house uh, in, in, in another state, whether that be Florida, North Carolina, Arizona, other Snowbird friendly states. And uh, so the thing I would want to avoid would be an ancillary probate. So when someone passes away, we need to do a probate, as you've discussed many times on, on your other podcasts. And um, based on uh, the, the constitutional concept of sovereign immunity between the states, one state cannot dictate how property in another state would pass. So any, pl- any state where you own real property, a house, you would have to do a probate. So um, ancillary probate can be costly and just adds unnecessarily t- unnecessary time and expense to um, someone's state administration. And uh, for that reason, I would do I would advise my clients to avoid it. And the way to avoid it is actually pretty simple. It's just create a revocable trust or another type of trust and transfer the property uh, into that trust. And then upon um, your client's passing, that that property will be pa- will pass via the trust and will not have to be probated. So just to clarify, ancillary probate is effectively just a second probate. Right? Absolutely, second probate. Because so you know, uh, we've talked at length sort of about how you know one probate is a big enough pain in the butt for clients and can be costly and just really time consuming. So obviously two probates is even more difficult. And also one of these probates is happening is probably happening in the state where your client isn't currently living. Exactly. So uh, and the ancillary probates are just as formal as the as the primary probate. And even though it could be just for one asset. So since we're talking about just the estate planning sort of basics of living in multiple jurisdictions, um, let's first, I think we should just establish the difference here between residency and domicile. Um, sure. I know for, for you know, us lawyers love to pick a word, and, and, but, but these words actually do mean different things under the law. And it is impo- very important to understand what that difference is. Absolutely. So, in general, um, you can only have you can have multiple residences. You could have a house in New York. You could have a condo in Florida. You could have a ski house in Vermont, but you can only be domiciled in one, one place. Uh, the simplest way to think of domicile is you can have houses multiple places, but you can only have one home. So your your domicile is always where you intend to return to. It's it's where you keep most of your important things. It's where you would consider your your home. For lack of a better word, All right, so it's you know it's it's enough that you consider it your home, but you know this, the government can't read your mind and they don't know, uh, you know what what you consider quote unquote home. So how do you establish? That well, that's where the done. controversy comes in for sure. Is you can consider typically you'll, you'll want to consider the place that taxes you the least to be your home, and uh, many states that uh, that will tax you a little bit more than those states uh, will consider uh, that state to be your home. Uh, New York, uh, for example, where, where we're sitting right now is, uh, loves to make sure, make, make sure everyone's domiciled here and not elsewhere. The big thing would be, uh, you know, for every state is the, for the first test is, is domicile and establishing that you're actually domiciled in that new state. Uh, typically we tell people change your driver's license, register to vote in the new state, start going to a church in the new state, draft some state plan documents for that new state make some friends in the new state, join a country club, basically move your life to the new state. And that's how you, you can begin to show, no, I really am domiciled in this new, typically lower tax state. And part of this, this establishing domicile is there's a lot of counting days in states involved here. Um, the number of days changes depending on what state you're trying to live in and what state you know, you're trying to not live in. Um, but generally, it's something about half the year more than half the year in, in the state you want to be in. Um, 
And so the state will count those days and you have to build, you have to, you get audited basically. And you have to prove that on X, Y, you were there for X amount of days. So, um, well, in, in New York, we have two tests. We have the domicile test where it doesn't matter how many days you were in New York, outside of New York, we still are going to consider you a New York resident. Um, so that could be people that, you know, took a, a year long cruise around the, around the world. Ultimately, you still wanted to come back to New York, pay tax on all of your New York income is how New York approaches that. And then there's the statutory residency test where we get into counting the days. Um, for New York, it's 183 days. Um, once you get to that 183 days, you can't be in New York anymore. Otherwise, we're going to count you as a New York resident. And uh, they can get pretty sophisticated with figuring out your days. Um, they're, they're going to check Facebook. They're going to... Uh, check your credit card receipts. Where were you buying things in that state? They're going to definitely check phone records. Um, it, it's almost like uh, tracking down a murderer at some at some points. Like they really put a lot of their resources into figuring out where you were each day. Yeah, and uh, different states are different levels of aggressive about this. I believe New York is by a wide margin, the most aggressive. I would agree with that. New York um, is very aggressive. Anecdotally, and I'm not sure if this is still the law, but several years ago, New York will count as a day any time spent in the state at all, uh, as long as you're not making a connecting flight or I think going to Sloan Kettering for treatment. I think those are like the two exceptions where you can be in New York and not have it counted as a day for domicile purposes. Absolutely, that, that is correct. If you if you pass through New York to get to Connecticut, you're that's a New York day. And just for uh, comparison, uh, a state like Ohio, um, I believe you have to sleep there for it to count as a day. So there are many people who will keep a home in, say, Indiana, which has lower taxes than Ohio, and they'll just commute and they'll sleep in Indiana. But even though they spend 90% of their time in Ohio, they're not an Ohio domiciliary because that rule is so lax. Yeah, New, New, New York is not that generous. <laughs> So this is a, a, a subject that's pretty near and dear to my heart because, um, you know, my mom is actually going through this process now. Uh, you know, she's been a New York resident her entire life. And then um, with, you know, the tax changes, she got blindsided by just an enormous tax bill last year. It was something, it, her taxes went up something like fivefold, really just crazy. Um, and that just shocked her into this idea that she had had a house in Florida that she, you know, was spending a, a couple of months at. And now it's just, you know, she was shocked and saying, okay, well, now I need to figure out how to, you know, get there. And you have, because Florida famously has no state, no state income tax. So the state taxes would be far, far lower in Florida. That's the whole advantage of living there. That's why, you know, other than South Beach, for example, you know, the Miami Heat have been so successful in signing free agents. Um, your general see athletes are happy to go to Florida and it's not just the climate. Um, you know, they save a lot of money. And we have a lot of golf professional golfers live in Florida for that exact reason. Uh, Tiger Woods lives in Florida, I think, only for that reason. This whole family's on the West Coast. Yeah. So I've sort of, you know, and this has happened in the last kind of less than a year. So she's, we've kind of had to sit down and plan and do a lot of math um, in terms of like figuring out like, okay, well, if you go down at this time to get, you need to get your days in now where we're all of a sudden forced into this struggle. And I imagine this is not, a unique experience for clients, right? Where all of a sudden you realize, crap, I don't have my days. No, that's not a unique experience um, at all. And the, the, the best the best thing for, for your mom and other people in her situation, I would say is keep a contemporaneous calendar. Um, it's kind of like uh, it, in the Judge Kavanaugh hearings, how he had all of those calendars. Hopefully and, a little less weird. Uh, hopefully <laughs> less weird. And well, that's my exact point is people thought this is very weird that he has all these calendars back to the early 80s. But, this, but people that are counting their days, this is exactly what we advise them to do is uh, have a calendar right down on each day where you are. And this has been uh, cases, we've, they, New York State's had many cases where people have these calendars and it's been accepted as, as proof as long as they've been keeping it contemporaneously. Yeah, I mean, my advice to her was basically to just buy something with your credit card. Every Absolutely. Day. That's, that's like another a, great a, idea. A buy the newspaper gum. every yeah. day, buy something. <laughs> exactly. Get that and save your receipt. Yeah, but yeah, save your receipts. I think if you take one thing away from this whole day counting uh, discussion is save the receipts because um, you're going to have to prove it. Are there any other major issues that sort of snowbirds face we have the ancillary probate and we have you know what about just general you own two houses i mean these you know this isn't necessarily an estate planning issue but this is sort of a general planning issue so 
my other recommendation for all my snowbird clients is um, typically they already have an estate plan in place and they have the power of attorney, the healthcare proxy, the living will. Typically that's for their home state, whether that be New York or elsewhere. And my recommendation is always put those documents in place for wherever you're going. Have a Florida healthcare proxy, have a Florida power of attorney, have a Florida living will. Uh, first of all, they have different names. It's called a declaration of healthcare surrogate in Florida. And uh, that's mainly the reason why I tell people have the documents for both states, because um, the doc, your New York documents are valid in Florida. They're valid all over the country. But when uh, you need to use someone needs to use that document on your behalf, they go to the hospital, they show your three, four five page New York healthcare proxy. The people in Florida are used to seeing about a 10 page document that says Declaration of Healthcare Surrogate. There may be a little delay in, I need to get my legal department to look at this. And when we need to use these documents, we typically need to use them now, not after the legal department's looked at it. So uh, my, my typical advice is let's, let's just have them in place for both states. Keep your Florida documents in Florida, your New York documents in New York, or wherever your home state is. And uh, unlike a will, you can have multiple healthcare proxies. You can have multiple powers of attorney. So it, I, I think that's the, the prudent thing to do. Well, I'm glad you mentioned a will because obviously owning property in multiple states and living in multiple states, uh, what are some of the issues, you know, with, with the will, uh, which, you know, do you have to have multiple wills? Do you have to, uh, which state is, you know, law controls? You know? Sure. Sure. So you can, uh, you can only have one will and your will is for, I'll just use Florida and New York as an example. If you execute your new, your will in New York under the formalities of New York law, that will will be valid in Florida and vice versa. New York will accept a will that was executed in Florida under the Florida formalities if you're a New York resident when you execute it and if you're a Florida resident when you execute it. However, the law of where your will is probated will control the probate. And uh, just to use New York and Florida as an example, uh, New York allows these no contest clause, these interim clauses. Uh, Florida does not does not enforce those clauses. So if it, the, the no contest interim clause is someone contests my will, um, they get nothing. So typically, uh, if we if we have clients who want to disinherit a son, uh, a daughter, or someone, we'll give them a minimal kind of bequest in the will as kind of a carrot not to. Uh, contest the will, and we can try, try to avoid a state litigation in that way. Uh, in Florida, that would not be enforced, so the person could still contest it, still get their ten thousand dollars. Whereas in New York, if they contested it, they would lose that that ten thousand dollar bequest. So interestingly, you know, even though your will is is written under New York law and executed under New York law, depending on where you die, you know, even though that will will still apply, it can be interpreted under a different state's law, and that's something that a client obviously has very little control over absolutely which is why it's a great idea typically sometimes with the wells you know we say it's like checking your oil come back every five years but as with checking the oil no one goes every three thousand miles or very few people do and uh sometimes as, as much as we'd love to have people come back as people's uh you know situations change they don't always come back but uh changing you know becoming a snowbird or moving to another state is definitely a great time to uh, get, get to check the oil, for lack of a better term, and make sure that the provisions in your in your will uh, still fit with what you want to do, but also will still mesh with your new state uh, in case your will is probated in that state. If you're living in multiple states, most people have a place where they want to be buried. Assuming that you have the 50-50 chance of dying not in that state, what happens with the body? Well, my recommendation for it for that would be to execute a disposition of remains that is going to empower someone um, to uh, dispose of your body in the way that you wish. So if you I've, I've had clients that say, I want to be cremated, I don't want a funeral and I want my my ashes spread in this certain uh, body of water in Hawaii. And I said, that's a great idea. But the only way I'm going to have any chance of enforcing that is if you sign this disposition of remains and we make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, anything with your with your body, 100%, do not put it in your will because typically when someone calls me my and tells me someone has passed away, my first instinct is, you know, we all, any attorney is going to say, mourn, mourn the laws, we'll deal with the, the state administration after. And typically, 
uh, items in your will are not going to be looked at until long after you're you're buried. So disposition of remains is, is certainly important for that exact concept to uh, be able to have what you want to have with your body happen. So using the example of Florida, New York, let's just be specific about it, what happens here. I, I want to be buried in New York, you know, out on the island with my people, you know, as a, a good Jew. And, you know, uh, but I, you know, die in Miami and I don't have a disposition of remains. What's my situation? Or what's my, I mean, really my executor's situation at this point? Well, your executor would would have to be uh, appointed. So there's going to be a process to just even have an executor appointed at that point because you don't have any, You don't, your state hasn't begun the administration process. I mean, if your family knows, hey, David really wants to be buried on Long Island, wherever you want to be buried, then they, they're going to be going into their pocket at that point to come up with the money to, to fly you back to, to New York. And then um, your estate, because you don't really have an estate at that point because nothing's been commenced, will have to recompensate those those people. But ultimately, your 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 body gets uh, gets flown back as long as your family knows your wishes. So that that's a really important concept: is make sure your family knows what you want. Is, is there any legal issue with taking a dead body across state lines like that, or is it just you know, you, you prove you know, give like a death certificate and you pay the airline enough and, and they'll just do it? Um, I, I've actually not encountered that in my practice yet. Um, I, I think, I think typically, um, I, I think the disposition of remains is, is, is certainly important for that. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question of, of what happens, but I think you're, I, you know, obviously I think people are tr- transported, you know, there's, there's definitely going to be a process. And I, and I think, uh, that's something to, to look into if you certainly have a specific place you want to be buried. So. We've mentioned that a lot of these, you know, your healthcare proxies will still apply. Are, are there any major documents that have to be filled out in the state that you that you eventually die in, or that you ha- happen to be domiciled in, that won't cross over like that? Any major estate planning documents, or is it basically everything will apply, and it's just safer to have the Florida version? Too? Everything should apply, mm-hmm. but the safest possible way would be meet to e- either meet with a an attorney in your home state that's licensed in both states, or when you get to the new state, meet with an estate planning attorney down there, have them look over your documents. Uh, most estate planning attorneys I know will look over your documents and th- they're not trying to create work for themselves. We, we typically have more than enough to do. And if, if everything's good, I, I meet with people all the time that I tell them everything's fine here. We, we don't really need to make any changes unless you want to make a certain change. And uh, definitely be cognizant of the state-to-state issues. Well, we're just about running out of time here. So, you know, I'm just going to put you on the spot like I do all my guests at the end here and, and have you try to take a complicated topic and, and tie it up in a little bow. I'm an attorney, an advisor, a wealth manager who has my first Snowbird client. I have no experience with this sort of thing. What's the one most important thing that I should be aware of? I think the most important thing is the probate in two states because that ultimately is going to be the most costly thing to your client. And uh, it's going to just create a lot of additional time and expense to the estate administration. It's going to be a headache for you because typically you're going to have to find an attorney in that other state and deal with that person uh, on behalf of your client's family at that point. So this is something that you could do you know, on your own in your office, create the trust, uh, get get it, get create the deed yourself, or get a company to create the deed and file everything for you, and save yourself a headache and save your client a lot of money. So you heard it here first, people. Uh, one probate is bad. Two probates even worse. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'd like to thank our guest uh, Daniel Bernard for being uh, being pretty awesome. Thanks for having me here. It was a, it's a great podcast. I, it's a pleasure to be on it. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. And uh, I'll, hear, I'll, I'll see you guys next time, or I guess you'll hear me next time on the next episode of the Dead Celebrity Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Dead Celebrity Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. 
The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Support for today's podcast is brought to you by FS Investments. Finding income for your clients is tough. FS Investments makes it easier by designing solutions that help investors reach their income goals and secure their futures. FS Investments never settles, so advisors and investors won't have to either. Visit fsinvestments.com slash dead celebrities and discover what it means to never settle. This is not an offer to buy securities. Investors are advised to consider investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing.